This video is sponsored by PCBV. Welcome everyone. In this video I show you how and why I made this cute little board. I wanted something small but relatively capable and since I have some experience with the CH32 V003J4M6 chip from my other projects, I decided to make this board based on the chip. This chip has an SOIC8 package, so it is a simple 8-pin SMD chip. Similar to the 80Tiny85, but it is a bit more powerful. I think I don't need to introduce this chip too much, because I have talked about it enough in my other articles and videos, plus it has a datasheet that can be read by the curious readers. However, I can tell more about the motivation of the project. Recently, I made a few circuits that control something simple, so it does not require a lot of GPIO pins and powerful computation capacity. Some of these projects were based on this chip, while others were based on the 80Tiny85 chip. The thing is that while the 80Tiny85 is around $1.5 per piece, I can buy 10 pieces of the CH32 chip for the same price. It is a considerable difference when it comes to scaling up the numbers. Since the CH32 has everything that the 80Tiny85 has, except SPI, I decided to design a board based on this chip. Although, towards the end of the video, I will show something that might benefit from the use of SPI. The chip is really simple, it works bare bone, and since I'm planning to use it with 5 watt logic devices, I don't even need a voltage regulator. The chip will only receive a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor on its power pin, but otherwise it will run off the 5 volt of the VUSB line. When designing the board, I went with the following design choices to preserve simplicity. 5 volt only operation, so there is no 3.3 volt compatibility. USB-C connector, and it should withstand currents up to 3 amps. No need for USB USART communication, so we can have a simpler 6 pin USB-C connector. No need for reset button and a very miniaturized footprint. In fact, the miniature footprint here is taken very seriously. The circuit board is not much wider than the USB port itself. It is also a perfect coincidence that the 2.54mm header pins can be lined up perfectly so that they don't exceed the width of the USB port and I can still plug the board into a breadboard. The distance between the two header pins is exactly 4 pins, which is the same distance as the distance between the adjacent pin rows at the center of the breadboard. Remember, breadboards have a groove in the middle, so there are some pins skipped there. Another great coincidence is that if I rotate the chip by 90 degrees, it fits between the two rows of the 2.54mm headers just fine. I had to juggle the wiring a bit, and I needed a few wires, but I managed to arrange everything neatly. However, this required the board to be two-sided. Both the bottom and the top of the board contain components. Luckily, there are very few components and they are large enough to be soldered by hand. One can use a hot plate for the bottom layer and then finish up the top with a hot air tool or even with a soldering iron. It depends on your patience and dexterity. In total, the board has seven components, two capacitors, two resistors, a microcontroller, a TVS diode and a USB-C port. I do not count the two 4-pin headers, because they are not mandatory for the circuit, especially if the board is built into some project, it can be omitted. You can just directly wire everything to the board. If you want to get this little board, then head over to my PCBWA project page and get either only the PCB, or by using their assembly services, the wall assembled ready to use board. And if you use this board in a project that would require 3D printed parts or some stuff made of metal, check out their 3D printing and metal working related services, so you can get all the parts for your projects from one place. Also, don't forget that you still have a little time to enter their 8 design contest. So if you have some interesting project to share, nominate it, and you will have a chance to win valuable prizes. When I came up with the idea of this board, I had three use cases in mind. The first one was the NeoPixel LED controller. This one is a simple but cool use case in my opinion. Another project could be an OLED display based thermometer. With a stylish 3D printed case, this device can be a nice addition to your home. And you can also build a real-time clock based on the DES3231 module. Again, with a stylish 3D printed case, this device can be a cool little gadget in your home. I will focus on the first use case, and I will explain how my timer and DMA based library works. So I'm going to ride the wave of my previous video here, and show an alternative way of driving these RGB LEDs. Previously, I used a smart hack implemented on the SPI bus, and here I will use a timer. The main reason why I use a timer here is that this microcontroller does not have an SPI peripheral. So the next obvious choice is using a timer. To reiterate, 
The LED works with an 800kHz timing basis. The bits that are passed to the LED in the 24-bit package are set by pulses. They are described as code 0 and code 1 pulses. The total period of a pulse is 1250 nanoseconds and basically we need to change the duty cycle of the pulse to generate code 0 and code 1. Code 0 is high for 400 nanoseconds and low for the rest, 850 nanoseconds, and code 1 is high for 850 nanoseconds and low for the rest, 400 nanoseconds. If we look at how timers work, we can see that we don't even need to bother calculating the duty cycle and such. A timer is mainly configured by setting its auto reload register and capture compare register values. The auto reload register tells the timer when to reset counting, and the capture compare tells the timer when to flip the sign of the output signal. At least this is a very simplified picture of it. So by considering the CPU's ticks, which is 20.83 nanoseconds in the case of a 48 MHz microcontroller, we can see that the 1250 nanoseconds wide pulse needs 60 ticks. Then the 400 nanoseconds is 19 ticks and the 850 nanoseconds is 41 ticks. So we can set the timer's registers accordingly. The only thing that we need to remember is that the code adds plus 1 to these numbers under the hood, so when I say 60, it is 60 minus 1. This is one of those gotcha things that can bite you later. So now we know these pulses very well. We understand how to generate an 800 kHz square wave with 50% duty cycle, so we can see the timing of the LED. And then we can further configure the capture compare register value to generate the code 0 and code 1 pulses. But the big question is, how to alternate the capture compare register values in subsequent pulses. When we send a data package to an LED, we need to send out 24 of these code 0 and code 1 pulses. And they won't be all 1s and zeros. Therefore, we must find a way to dynamically generate and manipulate the subsequent pulses, possibly without putting any burden on the CPU. And well, here comes the DMA, direct memory access, to save the day. For each LED, we need to transmit one 24-bit slot, which contains 24, 1250 nanosecond long slots, pulses, and for each slot, the capture compare register value is either 19 or 41. So whenever there is a timer update, the DMA should load the next capture compare register value to the timer's capture compare register from a pre-built buffer. These values are stored in a buffer when the color to bit conversion is done before actually instructing the LED to shine with some color. Once the transfer is done, we just keep the line low for at least 50 microseconds and we are good to go. So, we need to set up the timer and the DMA accordingly. The timer is rather straightforward. I picked the PC4 pin on the microcontroller because it does not have any other peripheral that I might need later. It has timer 1 channel 4 available, so we will work with that. Since I built the wall code into a library, I made most of the other parameters adjustable by modifying the macros values at the top of the library file. The timer does not need any special attention, and I already have a tutorial on timers where I define the timer basically the same way. The only differences are the following. I use timer 1 channel 4, so the output compare part must be described on channel 4. Therefore, for example, we initialize the clock by tim underscore oc4 in it instead of tim underscore oc1 in it. I also disabled both the preload config and the PWM outputs. They will be enabled later when we actually generate the pulses. The DMA is a bit more special. I touched DMA in my ADC related tutorial, but here we do a bit more. So first let me repeat that the way we generate the pulses is that when the timer generates an update event, the DMA should load the next CCR value into the timer CCR register. Why is this important? Because we need to map the peripheral to the correct DMA channel based on the event. As the image shows, the update event is under channel 5. So the DMA must be initialized with channel 5. Another good thing to know is the peripheral address of the timer. Again, we have timer 1, channel 4, so the peripheral address is tim underscore ch4 cvr. And since we work with the peripheral now, the transfer direction is memory to peripheral. The rest of the parameters are straightforward and they are typical or default parameters. The peripheral address does not need increments, so it is disabled. We always read the same timer channel. On the other hand, the memory address should be incremented, so in each iteration, the next item of the buffer is accessed. This is important because this buffer stores the next CCR value that should be loaded into the timer. And just a reminder, the data size here is 32 bits for a word and 16 bits for half word. This is easy to mess up because older architectures might refer to words as 16-bit units. 
To push out a 24-bit sequence of pulses that encodes the color and intensity of an LED, we need to start and stop the timer and DMA in a specific way. First, we apply a reset latching which holds the line low for more than 50 microseconds. This ensures that the subsequent pulse train does not get contaminated with garbage pulses and the LED will interpret the pulse train as it should be interpreted. I used 80 microseconds for my SPI based implementation, so I used the same here. Apart from latching the PC4 pin for 80 microseconds, I also disabled the timer and its outputs. Also, it is important to remember that there is a difference between using the PC4 pin as a GPIO pin or as an output pin for the timer. When it is used as a GPIO pin, its mode should be set to GPIO underscore mode underscore out underscore PP, which sets the pin as a regular push-pull GPIO pin. When we want to use the same pin with its timer-related functionality, we need to redefine the mode as GPIO underscore mode underscore AF underscore PP. This uses the pin's alternative function, which is the timer output pin. Then comes the fun part. Now we just focus on one LED, but my code is generalized for any amount of LEDs. It is only limited by the hardware. To make sure that the timer and DMA start from a clear state, I disable everything timer and DMA related and clear the relevant flags. Then I reinitialize the DMA according to the previously discussed parameters, addresses and so on. The next step is to sync the timer so I set its counter to zero and clear its flags. Then I enable the DMA requests on timer update and start the DMA. Then I generate an update event on the timer and clear the flag so the first real PWM bit that is pushed to the LED starts cleanly. After this cleanup, the main output of the timer and the timer itself are enabled. This will also start triggering the DMA since now the timer will start generating update events. The code waits until the transfer complete flag changes. After the flag is changed, the timer and DMA are stopped and another reset latching is performed to finally clean things up. So in theory, this would work very nicely, however, in practice it does not. When I, for example, send out an instruction that should set the first LED to red color at half brightness, while the global brightness is set to 255, so that I really should get half brightness, I get a very dim green color on the first LED. By looking at the pulses with an oscilloscope, I can see 24 pulses, so that should be ok at first glance. However, when I take a closer look at the pulses, I see a glitch. I can see that yes, the LED physically should be dim green, because according to the pulses, the bits of the green color are set to that value, and the rest of the bits for the other two colors are set to zero. And if you think a little, and recall how the colors are pegged in the 24-bit package, you will quickly see that the pulses are shifted. That single one should be one position to the right. Or we can think about it as if a pulse were missing from the beginning. With an extra pulse at the beginning, the binary would be correct, which would lead to a correct color. Actually, this only solves half of the issues. Now let's do the following exercise. Let's toggle the very last bit of the pulse train. This essentially means that we blink the LED's B0 bit by setting it to 0 or 1 with some delay in between. The LED should show a blinking dim blue color. Instead, we see a blinking bright green LED with occasional blue hints. So the end of the pulse train is still wonky and this can cause the last bit to spill over to the next pulse train and become its first bit. So then this dim blue would become bright green. The first bit of the pulse train is G7 and if that bit is set to 1, which translates to 128 in decimal, it will set the green LED to half brightness. Well, guess what the blinking LED's color is? It's green. To make this funnier, we can make the problem disappear by setting the number of LEDs to 2 or anything larger than 1. We still toggle the first LED as before, but now the first LED's pulse train is followed by an extra pulse, which is the starting pulse of the second LED. Now the first LED blinks dim blue, and since we haven't assigned anything to the second LED, it does not care about the pulse, plus the bits are zero anyway. So this suggests to us that we also need to add the closing pulse when we build the CCR buffer to make things work with the single LED. After adding the closing pulse, we get a dim, blinking blue LED, which is the correct color and behavior. The last bit does not spill over to the next pulse anymore. And with this, I have a working library for driving these RGB LEDs with CH32 microcontrollers using a timer and DMA. And just some final thoughts about this approach. It is a neat approach, but if the microcontroller supports SPI, I would choose SPI instead. This microcontroller was only able to drive a maximum of 34 LEDs with my demo code. 
I tested the same code with the CH32V006K8U6 development board I made earlier, and due to the four times more RAM, I was able to run roughly four times more LEDs. It's obvious. I tested it with my 16x16 LED array, and I could compile the code and light up roughly half of the LEDs on the array. Then I switched to SPI on my development board, and all of a sudden, the size of the code and RAM usage dropped, and I could drive all the 256 LEDs. So this is the reason why I mentioned that the lack of the SPI on this microcontroller could be a bit of an issue in some cases, because for this specific application, driving these RGB LEDs, the SPI approach is much more resourceful. Anyway, if you like this kind of content, please consider becoming a channel member. It helps me to buy more gadgets and create similar content and publish more, hopefully helpful stuff. Also, don't forget to visit my website. I wrote a detailed article with some extra pictures and resources, which are worth checking. I also put a direct link in the article that leads you to my PCBWay project site for this board. So I hope that you liked this video, I hope you learned something, and see you in the next video.